You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number six of the podcast. And today our topic is going to be people who have just entered the program within the past year. In contrast to last week's episode where we had LJ share his experience uh, for the past 16, 17 years in program, we thought it would be interesting to hear people who have just started the program in 2020. The interesting thing for me is hearing their experiences, finding their ways to the rooms while on Zoom rather than a face-to-face meeting. This recording is just a few weeks shy of us being on Zoom for the past year. A few of the meetings in the Bay Area have gone back face-to-face for a short period of time where they were doing hybrid meetings. Some people face-to-face and other people on Zoom attending the same meeting. But for the most part, our meetings are still on Zoom. And not only did I want to hear from people who have just been in the program for the past year about how they found Zoom, but what their experience has been like being in SAA for the past year, uh, what their experience with the fellowship and uh, working the steps uh, has been. So we had a really interesting conversation, which I'll be sharing pretty shortly. And before getting to the reading and the conversation, I wanted to do a little housekeeping. We've had a few inquiries on the feedback email, feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com, about listening to the podcast and the podcast length. Uh, number one, uh, we have our host site landing page, which is sarpod, S-A-R-P-O-D dot libsyn dot com. And if you're listening to the podcast there, I just noticed that there is no pod length description for each of the episodes. At the very top of the page, there are links of different places where you can listen to the podcast whether if you download it or listen to it on an app or anything, there's one for Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcast, and Spotify. We're also on iHeartRadio. And most of those podcast platforms have the actual length of the podcast in the description. The first few of our episodes have been short. Uh, these were initial recordings that I had done in 2019, And just as a basic concept of what I wanted to do for the podcast, uh, most of the newer ones are being recorded on Zoom, and we are shooting for about uh, 40 minutes to an hour in conversation, whether it's a roundtable discussion or a one-on-one conversation with somebody. I find that the length of that gives enough time and depth to really cover a topic. I may do some one-off, um, some one-off episodes without doing a conversation, which will be much shorter on the range of about 10 to 15 minutes to kind of balance having the lengthier episodes. So anyway, with listening to the longer episodes, you know, with the, the format on different pl- platforms, you can, you don't have to listen to it all in one shot. I thought about, uh, breaking it up into smaller chunks into like half an hour bits, but I find that that might disrupt the flow of the conversation and ev- everything. So I'm going to be keeping the length to roughly about 45 minutes to an hour, an hour and 15. So with that, I'd like to turn to a reading about meetings. 
In episode two of the podcast, I read a little bit from the SAA Green Book from chapter two, which is called Our Fellowship and the subsection on meetings. And skipping to page 11, I wanted to read a short paragraph here. As sex addicts, we are prone to isolating. Many of us acted out alone or in secret. Meetings are an important way of breaking this isolation. At meetings, we discover that we are not unique. If we listen to the experiences and feelings we have in common, we will find that we are more alike than we are different. At meetings, we learn that we can trust others to know who we really are and still be accepted by them. And I wanted to highlight this paragraph because in the conversation, it really touched on some of the same points that were in the reading, uh, the terminal uniqueness that we all thought that we had, and learning that that we can trust others with our dirtiest secrets that we thought that we would take to the grave and still be accepted by the fellowship. And with that reading, I'd like to turn it over to the conversation we had just last night, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, so welcome, guys. Uh, one of the things that, that I was thinking about is you know, discussing you know, entering the program in this past year. You know, 2020 was a, a fucked up year for a lot of us and um, an interesting time to enter program. Uh, I wanted to start with um, the, I've mentioned it on, uh, I think, one or two of the other podcasts that uh, the, in the Silicon Valley where I live, that we had a Monday, Wednesday, Friday meeting Um that met at noon and so it was my lunch break you know i'd go over and go to that meeting and last march uh it was it was so weird that you know i left the meeting when we were discussing yeah i guess the the month prior in february we were really starting to socially distant distance ourselves um, you know, just hearing the news and then leaving the meeting was when the news broke that uh, uh, Santa Clara County, which is where the, the meeting was, uh, they were going to start to do a full lockdown. And I went left the meeting and went straight from there into my uh, work. And uh, the executives were trying to decide whether or not we were going to stay on site, which we eventually did. But that was the last face-to-face -face meeting that uh, that I've been to, and the week um, following, we had a uh, a struggle to get Zoom links up for the uh, sixty-plus uh, Bay Area meetings, and a lot of them happen at the same time, so we we're having to open up different Zoom accounts and and everything. And um, we eventually got uh, all the, the meetings up and running. And with the Monday, Wednesday, Friday meeting, we had, you know, a core group of people that were showing up and everyone loved uh, over the, the next month, everyone, you know, really loved the idea of having those meetings and wanted to expand it to Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, those were never official um, SAA meetings and they were unlisted anywhere. And so it was the same group of guys, usually about uh, 20 or so. And then uh, eventually we decided to officially register them as telemeetings with the ISO on the uh, uh, SAA-recovery site. And we started getting inquiries from, you know, people all around the country. And, you know, at first we were trying to keep Tuesday and Thursday separate from the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So the Monday, Wednesday, Friday would still have kind of a local localized feel for it. Um, but, you know, we started inviting more and more people and it, it just became this, this wonderful group um, that, you know, some days we have 40, some days we have 60. And it's just been an amazing thing. So one of the things that I've noticed, you know, I've been in program a long time and, and you know, came in in 
uh, when meetings were face to face, but uh, wanted to discuss the idea of people who have entered uh, the program in the in the past year. Um, wanted to talk about um, finding a meeting uh, in the, in the Zoom format. Um, you know how you found it, what uh, your background was, and stuff, and why why you uh, made your way to the rooms. Um, and um, I had a, a, another another thing that I oh yeah, uh, what your experience has been like over the past year. Uh, how your recovery has been, you know, what types of things are you doing uh, if you're working steps or if you're holding back and stuff like that. So I wanted to, to open it up to anyone that wanted to share how, uh, how they found the, the rooms of SAA. Yeah, I'd love to share that. Um, yeah, I think what's, what's important is, uh, yeah, like how we all got here. And so for me, um, I mean, my journey started early. Uh, if there's one thing that I, I uh, one theme that a lot of us in these rooms have in common, it's abuse, it's trauma. Uh, I'm no exception, you know, uh, from a young age. Um, I was exposed to sex and not in a fun way um, at six. And, um, you know, introduced to pornography not shortly after that. Uh, and then, um, I'm sorry, shortly after that. And then um, pornography just kind of found its way into my life. Um, you know, and then by the time I was a teenager, it was just, it was everywhere. I was seeking it out like it was a kid looking for candy and um, the internet came along in college and that's what I did. That's all I did. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, in my, uh, my first step presentation, I kept an, inc an incidence in there when um, I had people hanging out in my room in college and uh, a buddy pointed out how discolored the carpet was by my computer. <laughs> and um, uh, I, and people laughed and I was just, I, I just felt like my heart sink. I felt so disgusting. And I just um, like that night I went and got carpet cleaner and scrubbed the carpet. And that was my very first, swearing off of this kind of behavior and um swearing i'd never do it again obviously <laughs> spoiler alert didn't happen um but uh yeah that lasted for years i mean just i mean like two decades of that and then uh i made the move here to the bay area uh under really stressful circumstances and um didn't realize at the time what i was giving up which was family which was friends which was a whole network of people I knew personally, professionally, um, and came here and discovered dating apps, discovered chat apps. And I just, you know, that became like my go-to escape for the incredibly stressful existence I was, I was living at the time. And, um, uh, I met my girlfriend at that time, uh, through the apps, um, you know, and that didn't stop me from pursuing other women on the apps. I just, you know, I would, yeah. um, my compulsive behavior was just staying up till two, three in the morning, swiping, chatting, trying to get women to do stuff they probably wouldn't normally do. And, uh, um, and then that went away. Um, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, and then I should add that, you know, I was having, I was having sex, uh, behind her back, um, with, with, handfuls of women. And, um, I got to a point for me where I really wanted to quit that I did. And I kind of curbed that. And I can, I can remember when I was able to kind of stop that behavior, it came to a really scary end for me. Um, and I remember coming when I was able to curb that behavior, I very quickly found I had a really intense desire to connect with her, with my girlfriend and, and get straight um, and that lasted, God, maybe, maybe four or five months before I started getting back on apps. And that's when I just went as dark and deep as I have ever gone. And that mm -hmm. lasted a good six months until one night during, during, after lockdown started, I couldn't get off my phone and I was on, I was chatting with women in the middle of the night and my girlfriend rolled over and saw my phone and, um, 
I just, you know, long story short, I wound up throwing myself on the fire, telling her what I'd been doing. And very quickly, I'm talking within like five, 10 minutes, I was revealing to her that like 15 years before I'd been to a sex addict um, 12 step meeting before, um, mm -hmm. didn't think I had a problem with it. I obviously do. Maybe I'm a sex addict. And that night I was in a meeting <laughs> and I was in a meeting every day after that for four months. Um, sorry, this is a lot longer than the two or three minutes I thought I was yeah. going to take up that. How did no, you, I, I'm just hoping someone hears that and like relates somewhat to it. But yeah, I, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, totally. Um, how did you find um, the the meeting? So I had just Googled and it's first thing that came up. And awesome. um, I got on like a phone meeting and they were talking about circles. And there's like, I'm just expecting people to be like morose and in despair. And I just sort of like kind of, kind of, cheery people encouraging each other and um and giving these stories of like i don't know hope i guess and um and i went and kind of told my girlfriend about it. i'm like they're talking about circles and all this stuff i'm like maybe i should write these things down like that because i stayed after the meeting and someone explained it to me but like i called the number on the website mm -hmm. i um i there's like a portal on there like i messaged two or three times and there's an email address on there as email like i sent like probably seven ten messages like in that those first two days and i wasn't hearing back from anyone i don't know what i think it was just because of covid it was a little messy and then i finally yeah. got a call from someone and it was just like the most calming presence i that i could have ever expected and he was just telling me his experience telling me it's going to be okay telling me i'm doing the right thing by going to meetings uh, and then he he offered to be my temporary sponsor. And uh, three weeks later, I asked him to be my sponsor. And so like literally the first person I talked to, I hate sharing that story because some people struggle to find sponsors. Yeah, yeah. But the first first person I talked to wound up being my sponsor. Awesome. How about uh, anyone else want to chime in with their, their story and how they got? Yeah, I, I, I can share. Um, so I actually started, um, you know, my, I've been, now that I'm in the program and looking back on my acting out, I mean, I've been acting out since, you know, I, since I'm a really young age. And something that always gets me in 12-step programs is that I'm not a victim um, of trauma. And, um, you know, I had a great um, upbringing and childhood and a loving family. So that, So it made it more difficult sometimes to be like, huh, am I in the right place? Like, I, I don't relate with some of like the origin stories. And so, so it can't be me. But, you know, I through some unfortunate trial and error and, and really connected with the program. But um, it came to a head. This was uh, December of 2019. Um, you know, I had previously had a, a couple years before that had a serious girlfriend. Um, and we broke up upon discovery that I was talking and texting with other girls the entire time throughout over a year. Um, and really me having no explanation for it um, because I, I really loved her and, you know, enjoyed our relationship. And, and my actions were in no way, you know, representative of how I felt. And so I was kind of at a loss for words. Um, but, but I didn't really connect the dots yet. Um, and then I was single, so I had no accountability in, in my acting out, just went full blown. Um, the, and, it, and it luckily kind of kept in compulsive masturbation and porn and, and dating apps, but, but nothing illegal. Um, but then um, my current girlfriend, we met through the apps and within two, three weeks of dating, we decided that we wanted to be exclusive. Um, and, you know, then she left for a family vacation. Um, and within like a couple of days, I had slept with someone else. Um, and in the whole time, even before, I'm like, I know it's wrong, but we're not officially like just making up all these excuses. Um, and right after, you know, this experience, within five minutes, I leave this girl's apartment and I call my current girlfriend and just tell her. And, and it was 
Um, that was when I knew that it was something bigger um, than just being unfaithful because I had such a traumatic experience before and, and lost so many relationships because of my behavior. Um, and here I, and, you know, at the time I was like, I'll never do this again. I'll never do this again. And here I was in the exact same situation um, with no words to describe it. Um, so, you know, I fessed up and she was still on the vacation. So, um, you know, she was devastated. Um, and then I called my parents and, you know, just kind of told them what happened and that I told my girlfriend. Um, and from there, I, I've i experienced in another 12-step program. So I didn't know SAA like existed, but I just had a feeling that the only other time I felt kind of this unmanageability was with my previous addiction. Um, so that's kind of where I started. I um, mean, at, at the time there were uh, in-person meetings. So, so I went to some in-person meetings in my uh, area and then um, I worked downtown. So I would also go during my lunch break um, and things were really good for a while. Um, and then COVID hit and COVID really messed it up. Um, I yeah. started becoming complacent. I, um, didn't really, you know, my other program, it, it, I don't have so much maintenance. I, I have been sober for many years, but I don't really do much for it. Um, and I assumed that would happen with my sex addiction and, and that, you know, after a couple of months, I just would stop going to meetings and whatever, and I'd be fine. Um, but with COVID, I was now working from home. I was, um, you know, isolating a lot of it and I, really started and I didn't really have a sponsor. Um, and so I stopped going to meetings. I, I really started getting into middle circle about as middle circles you can get. Um, and that lasted probably that was March until like September. Um, and I maybe went to like one or two tele meetings when like something came up here or there, but um, really didn't do anything for my program. And, and in September I slipped. Um, I, I, I reached out and, and, uh, sexted a, another girl um, mm. and that was in my gut I knew like okay I crossed the line um, and again I, I immediately my girlfriend got home from work I told her um, what had happened and and then again I, I knew the first thing I did I went to a meeting online and I found that uh, through Google because I was familiar with some of the telemeetings mm -hmm. um, but it was a telemeeting, not a Zoom meeting. And then I discovered the difference between those. Um, and they said, oh, you shouldn't tell her. You should. And I just had such I have such guilt. So I have a tendency to overshare for better or for worse. So um, <laughs> out of this, just like I need to throw my guilt onto someone else um, as if I'm doing that, as if I'm doing them a favor. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I was like looking back on the past six months. I'm like, well, no shit, I slipped. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I, I was, I was, I had the three circles in my three circles on my phone, and then went. I don't. I never looked at them, and then I'm like, wait, you've been crossing the line the whole time. I, it was just like such at the back of my mind. Um, so, I discovered this meeting and some other Zoom ones. Um, and it's just been such a lifesaver. I mean, like literally a lifesaver. Like it saved my life, not just like you know the common phrase, but um, to be able to um, have a set time every day and working from home makes it just too easy. Um, it This slip just allowed me to to really go into the program. And, and my sponsor, I would have never met uh, had I not gone to the Zoom meetings. And, you know, my friends in the program, my sponsor and everyone is nobody lives in my area. It's all um, across the country. So. Um, it's just been such a blessing for such a time that is so isolating. I am so grateful that, you know, the Zoom meetings, I had an issue with the telemeetings because they went 90 minutes and I thought uh -huh. that, was a real, that was a long time. Um, but but just the Zoom meetings are literally like the same as the in-person for me. Um, I feel the same as when I would leave those rooms. So um, nice. it's just really great. Awesome. Who else would like to, to share? If it's okay, I'll speak because I'm falling out. Yeah, uh, yeah, go for it. I know cool. it's late over there on the on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the East Coast, and you're my sponsor, you know, but I won't <laughs> say 
And so, you know, there's certain things. Yeah. And what's interesting is I've heard some of the people who have actually everyone who's talked so far, I heard their first step. And uh, so my and that really inspired me. But I'm putting the cart before the horse. I loved what everyone said. I, I don't want to go through my whole history of using right now because I'm really down about what's going on in Venezuela. And I can't go through my own personal can I swear on this podcast? Fuck yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't go through my personal fucking apocalyptic history right now. I just can't for my own mental health. I mean, before this, I was watching Bob's Burgers because I just <laughs> had to get some happiness into my life. Nice. Uh, so what I'm saying is, let me start with the happy stuff. So I got clean in N.A. when I was 22 and I'm 40 now. So I got clean there a long time ago, and I've maintained regular meeting attendance. But I couldn't get clean, and I'm a product of abuse, too. And I think I was – what's so weird is I got clean so young, but I was in denial of my parallel sex addiction running alongside. And now it's very clear, but it wasn't then. And I was afraid to jump off the cliff and come to meetings for a long time. I worked – the steps in another program trying to take care of this. And it was all acting out that related to my addiction and that I didn't really like people touching me. And so I would uh, act in and do stuff alone. But I hurt plenty of people too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, every, everything that's been shared, I can relate to that way. So, but I would act in a lot and I got married this year in COVID. I've gotten married this year. I've got, I got into grad school at my dream school. What else happened? And I know a lot of people have died and I know it's been a hard year for people. So I'm not saying, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I got clean on SAA and other stuff too, that I'm not even thinking of right now. So a lot of things I, Oh, I found my biological father. That's the other one. Oh, I'd never done. So I got to thinking during COVID and I started making some changes. <laughs> so anyway, SAA. So finally, during the beginning of COVID, I was home a lot and I was on my computer a lot. So I decided to make some changes. And with the blessing of my wife, which I think is different from a lot of people, I was always kind of a confessionalist and she knew what was up with me. And I think part of it is she's from another country. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting, and this is one of the things I love about SAA is the variance. And you'll hear this between us. The idea of the circles yeah. is that we don't necessarily decide what's bad and what's not bad for anybody else. Although I certainly ask guidance from you and I would do it from anyone here if I had something I thought was compulsive. But in the end, each individual is left to make the choice. And What's interesting about that in my case, I think, and I share it just in case someone's listening and is in the same boat, is that my partner was so on board with this, and she's from another country. She's from Vietnam. So her idea of what acting out was is maybe different, and or the idea of acting out was definitely foreign to her. It was a new concept, but... She didn't necessarily think what I was doing was acting out. It was just that it was affecting her negatively. And I had shared with her what I did before. But the fact that I hadn't cheated on her physically was the thing for her. So in her mind, I was just taking positive steps. And it was just an extension of N.A. But uh, I know what I was doing before I met her. And I know that, to me being married and having phone sex all the time because you can't be physically intimate is not healthy. Mm. So, you know, and ever since my abuse, almost immediately I had, I had phone sex and I just think it was, I just had a hard time. I have a hard time being physically intimate and I still struggle with that. And I just want to say that because if anybody wants to, that's a, that's a battle and it's a slow process and I'm well, I'm glad I'm with someone who is helpful in that way. Uh, what else? I feel like mine's a little bit less linear and a little bit nuttier. Uh, it's all good. Less cohesive. 
Okay, cool. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, the first step. So this is way different in this program. So the first step in SAA is a lot like uh, the fourth and fifth in another program in NA. Mm -hmm. So it was deep, man. And I heard the two people here do it, and I was really moved. And I was like, oh, God, I want to do it. And you know, Jason, I am an NA, but I'm also on psych meds. I don't mind saying that on a thing. And I told everybody beforehand, I've already taken mine. So I'm half asleep. I can't even, I'm looking at different places on the wall. I need to stop talking in about two minutes because I, who knows what the hell, I'm just going to start talking about David Bowie. But, <laughs> but you help me, Jason, because uh, I wrote it and it didn't make a lot of sense after a certain point. It kind of spiraled. And you said, you know, it feels like the second half, Jason, you got a really nice way of saying the truth. You yeah. say the truth, but you say it so positively. It's impossible to deny. Yeah, and I, I told and you, you to said, flesh it out. Flesh it out. It feels like an idea. And I did that and said it, and it was a really positive experience. But what was so weird is I heard everybody else's, and I thought was mine was pretty much the same. But the response I got from everyone, and I'll close with this, is, you are so fucked up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they were, like, impressed at how fucked up I was. And I kind of liked that, like, my ego. It was like, oh, yeah, I'm the worst. But. I'm not the worst. I just, we all have done different things. Uh, okay. I'm done. Before, before uh, you're, you're done. I wanted to uh, hear how you found, uh, how you found the meetings. I started at the phone meetings and I got a different sponsor before you yeah. and it got weird. And I'm not going to say anything bad in public. When things get weird, I have plenty of friends who are on the edge of, the American life, you know, <laughs> right on that edge. And it got weird with the sponsor, but you've heard me talk now for too long. I mean, it very well could have been me, but when things get weird, they get weird. So they got weird very fast and I had no other point of reference. So I, I stopped completely. And then one day I was like, I gotta go again. I gotta give it a shot. Let me look up a zoom meeting. And I looked it up and found this one, and I literally have just kept coming ever since. Awesome. That's what, yeah. And I found you very early on. Yeah. God, remember when we met? And it was just like, so, it was like meeting my wife. You're like my <laughs> wife, you know. I just yeah, we met have both of you, and it was just wonderful. Common interest in, in, in music and TV and film and stuff. So uh, we right. connected, and it, it was great uh, after that. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, anyone else yeah. like to share their, their story of, of um, how they got here? Sure. Uh, happy to go. Uh, really enjoyed listening to the other folks share. And um, I think, you know, one of the things I found in SAA is it's amazing how often you hear something that really resonates. And then there's a fair amount of time to hear something and say, nope, that's not me. Um, and those, you can just never predict when you're going to hear one or the other. Um, and, uh, you know, so my, my lifetime addiction has been porn, um, and masturbation. And, um, I thought it was fine. I thought it was just what everybody did. And then all of a sudden it became clear it wasn't fine. Um, and, you know, I just had this, um, just, uh, in a, a rupture in my relationship with my wife. And um, it became very clear that I needed to, you know, figure out how to get my life together um, or, or I was going to be alone. And, um, and so I started looking online um, and I found an, another program called Porn Addicts Anonymous, which was good, but it was pretty far away and didn't have very many meetings. And uh, so I reached out, I found that there's a, a Bay Area SAA group, bayareasaa.org. Um, and I just sent in a, an email, um, info at bayareasaa.org. And uh, I mean, almost immediately, like in 45 minutes, I had a really nice email back and, and a list of meetings to attend and, um, uh, and I just found tremendous um, acceptance and openness and, uh, uh, and help. <laughs> I needed help. I knew I needed help. Um, and I found it. Um, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts. 
And um, I, I, I started with the Zoom meetings and, um, and it's, a little, it's a little hard to get started. The, the, the Zoom links aren't all just out there, but if you go to one meeting and you talk to some people, then they'll give you links to other meetings. It's, it's not hard if you want. Um, and then I started finding you know, the same people going to the, these different meetings. And so I started getting to know you know, uh, other people and um, through that got to find a sponsor. And what I'd have to say is, you know, Zoom meetings alone probably wouldn't do it, but Zoom meetings plus a sponsor really does for me anyway. It gave yeah. me that human contact. It gave me a person who knew me, who cared about me, who was guiding me um, and uh, telling me to be gentle on myself, which is the opposite of what I felt like doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think those, those two things together really were what kind of got me, got me started to turn around. Yeah. I was going to say that, you know, it's um, similar in face-to-face -face meetings, you know, just you know, going to face-to-face -face meetings alone. Um, it helps, but you know, once you get the sponsor and start working the steps, uh, that's, you know, where the, the, the real uh, work starts, uh, starts to happen. Um, so we've got a little bit of time here and wanted to talk, you know, the thinking of sponsorship and working the steps, um, you know, where you guys are uh, within the, the, the first uh, year of being in program, uh, how you are with um, step work and stuff like that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Um, so I found, especially with the Zoom meetings, that, you know, the step work has made it, the Zoom meetings have made step work, honestly, a lot easier for me. Um, and what I think about in my recovery now is if I can't sign on to a computer and spend an hour, I don't even have to move rooms, then, like, what does recovery mean to me? Um, you know, I don't have to get in the car. I don't have to do anything. I just have to say, just click. It takes two seconds uh, after, you know, I found the consistent place. But um, it's just made that, like, the wall so much less high to, like, jump over. Um, and that's kind of flowed into step work and sponsorship. And, you know, when I started in in-person meetings, I, I asked someone, I was pretty lost. I asked him to be my sponsor and it didn't work out. Um, but even then it was like, you know, come meet me at a coffee shop. That's like 40 minutes from my house at like eight 30 on the sand. Yeah. Like I'm like, and I'm like, is there a way we could like meet in the middle? And he's like, no, he's like, how bad do you want it? I'm like, Not I mean like, what? <laughs> like no. So, uh, and now, you know, with my current sponsor, I mean, it's a text, it's a call. It's, you know, I'm, he lives in a different state. So um, everything has just become so much better. And this is the first, you know, I was involved in, in, I, in my other 12-step 12, 12 program. And I honestly didn't go through the 12 steps. And I've maintained sobriety for a couple of years. And um, this is, you know, I've finally honestly worked through the steps. And I just finished my step nine. Um, nice. And it's just great. And it's easy. Um, and a lot... In, and I know recovery and ach achieving it isn't always easy, but but this kind of environment just makes you think like if you're not willing to click a couple buttons and, and you know, spend some time in front of your screen, then, you know, what is important? And that's kind of how I think of it. Nice. How about you other guys? Um, I could share just questions more about like what the steps have brought me. Oh uh, yeah, just you know where yeah. you know um, so you you guys have all you know just been been in the program for you know a year yeah. or less and you know kind of where you are just to yeah. let you you know I was in program for about a year and a half before I, I asked to get a sponsor and, and mm -hmm. started working the steps and then it took me another few years to to go through the steps yeah. for the first time. So just curious to see, you know, in, in this day and age and in this format, yeah. you know, where, where you guys are with, with uh, step work. The, uh, I'm glad you guys both shared that. Cause I think it's important for anyone listening to know that everybody has a different journey in this. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, 
I've heard of guys that that have that just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. No sponsor, no steps. But then when they finally did it, they just took off, and their recovery actually started. You know, getting some traction, and they were able to piece together little pieces of sobriety here and there. Uh, it's quite different for me. Um, I came in. I've, uh, I'll back up just a little bit. I've always known there was something really wrong with my behavior. Um, I didn't know what it was. A lot of my life was spent really pursuing things to to try to get myself right. And my, I like to compare it. I've compared it in the past to like me thinking there was just one little dial that was wrong on the machine. And if I could just get this thing calibrated right, like if I maybe if I just did yoga every day for a month. Or if I like started this, like I went on these like no fat forums where like you're challenged to like not masturbate for a month. I was just always trying to find something. And like I said, trying to like find the right dial that just needed to be set right. I didn't realize that the whole machine was fucked. And, and, mm. um, and when discovery happened and like the whole freaking curtain just came, came down and I was able to see what the hell was really wrong with me. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say what's wrong with me. What was going on with me? I just, I had this intense desperation and desperation really brought me in the rooms. And I, like, like, I, got, like I told you, I got a sponsor within that first week. Um, I already had my circles written before I even met him. And um, I was just, uh, I was just, begging him to tell me like how do I get started like what do I do and you know his thing was my first step was to write my entire sexual history it was 40 pages long it took me two hours to read it to him when I was finished and damn um yeah it's just (laughs) it's a lot of work it's very triggering work but um uh um yeah I just I wanted to stop I felt and um what anyone listening who's even considering coming into a room or thinks they maybe even have a have a might have a problem um or are ashamed of it or embarrassed i will tell you i think i had an experience i've had that a lot of people have shared which is uh i had this thing that we in the rooms called terminal uniqueness i had this (laughs) feeling like i had this feeling like yeah that i was doing this thing that nobody else was doing um that nobody would understand if anybody heard it they would just think i was crazy um and it was just a few meetings in and hearing people sharing this exact sharing that they have, had been engaged in this exact same behavior that I thought was totally unique and shameful to me. Um, it just, it took that away. It took that, that shame away. And then it, that desperation became, uh, became just pure motivation. And I just would sit down and crank, crank away, typing away. Um, I wrote, my first step. I also wrote um, what's called a disclosure. If someone doesn't know what that is, that is um, if you uh, have a partner that you've betrayed through your behavior, a disclosure um, is uh, basically a full confession of everything you've done. Um, and uh, we, we use the term discovery. That's when you get caught. Um, disclosure is when you voluntarily release all that information. Um, so I began writing that as well in conjunction with my first step. So it was just a lot of work. Um, but the main thing I got from my first step was just not feeling alone, not feeling mm-hmm. like, not feeling like I was the only one in this set, like there are other people going through this and I could say anything I could have, I could have, I could have said the worst thing I had ever done in that meeting and f- five or six people would have been like me too, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, And then from the second, the second step um, for me was just uh, realizing that, that there's not, that there's a chance to get out of it, that there's a chance, that there's an opportunity, another, another existence for me. And um, step two is coming to believe that a, a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And what a lot of people, I did what a lot of people do, which was I looked to, you know, you don't, it doesn't, it sounds religious in tone, but uh, for a lot of people, just taking on uh, the group, the fellowship, the program Mm -hmm. as a power that's greater than yourself um, helped me. 
And then step three, uh, which is made a decision to turn our will over to the care of God as we understood God. You know, you can take out God and put higher power. And when I did that, the higher power is the group, uh, is, the, is the fellowship. And so for me, step one was just every meeting. I just wanted to hear people say they were doing the same shit I was doing. So I wouldn't feel so alone. So I'd just be a little more encouraged to get to, to move on. Mm -hmm. And then step three was, well, what's my higher power's will? Well, my higher power is, is the fellowship. So in meetings, I wasn't really listening. In step three, I wasn't listening to all the crazy crap people had done anymore. I was listening for what they're doing now. I'm like, what's this, what is this fellowship's higher power for me? And um, what I heard was I heard people dealing with codependency and when people would bring that up, it really resonated with me. I have yeah. a, I have a, I have a very deep um, codependency issue. Um, and then another was uh, people, you know, a lot of people in these rooms are in other programs. I heard a lot of people say, uh, talk about their money problems, talk about DA, debtors anonymous. Uh, and I'm like, man, that sounds like something I should check out. And I, so I checked those meetings out, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and so uh, the, the core, the key thing is, is, yeah, if, if you're just coming into this program now or you think you might want to come into this program, for you in this moment, it is all about sex. It is all about stopping this crazy sexual behavior. And then very quickly, very, very quickly for a lot of people, and I think I'm included, is very quickly in the program, you realize it's not about sex. Sex is the way what we use to cope with these problems that 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 were just eating us up inside my codependency my 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 basically financial anorexia and my under earning and like yeah. i was avoiding those things by acting out with sex um it's not to say like that i'm cured of my sex addiction and now i can go face these other things i just know if i don't address these other things and i let them fester then my addict, my sex addict is just sitting there waiting, waiting for a chance to, you know, for his opportunity to, to get me to escape again. So um, that's been my short experience in these steps. I'm on step four now and just uh, um, doing my inventory, talking about all the people I can't stand and how much <laughs> they, uh, all the, all the um, resentments I have, and then writing out what my part and having those resentments is. And it's just, if it's giving me what I think is one of the biggest gifts of this program, which is uh, an ability to observe my, th my own thinking instead of react to how I'm feeling all the time. I can stop, I can breathe, I can think about what I'm, what I'm feeling, see what it's doing to my thinking, and I can do the next right thing. Um, it's probably been the biggest gift of this program. Nice, nice, that's awesome. Uh, any others want to jump in? Sure. I've, I've been in the program for about seven months. Um, and everybody goes through at a different pace. Mm -hmm. um, and on a daily basis, um, I, um, I pray, I do some meditation, usually do a little bit of reading. Um, I do some sort of a meeting three or four times a week. It's a, it's a pretty big time commitment. Um, on the other hand, my porn habit was a pretty big time commitment. <laughs> yeah, so totally. it's, Amen. Kind of, it's not like I'm actually losing any net time out of this. And I sleep a lot better. I have a lot better relationships in my life. Um, I think, you know, um, a couple of other people have said it. I, I don't think of my addiction as the problem. It's a symptom of, the pro of a much deeper problem and a much broader problem. Um, and I think this program is, is trying to kind of get to the root of, of what was causing that symptom, uh, along with a number of others. And, and, you know, like so many other things, it's, it's, you get out of it what you put into it. And, and this is not about a quick fix. This is really kind of a lifetime program of spiritual awakening to a world that's bigger than just my selfish, mm. you know, ego wandering through picking fights, um, and kind of the way that I think about the, the 12 steps is, you know, 
you <laughs> the first step an alcoholic has to take is to admit they have a problem because that's the one thing you never do when you're an alcoholic so or an addict um mm -hmm. so really the first three steps are about admitting you have a problem to me the next three steps three or four steps are about admitting that you have more than one problem <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so that gets you from four to seven. And then the next couple of steps are going out to people who you hurt because of your problems and saying, I fucked up. Mm -hmm. And then the last three steps to me are, OK, well, how do I how do I stop hurting people, including, by the way, hurting myself? Um, and uh, and then, you know, one of the things that's so inspiring for me, you know, kind of going to these meetings and being in these rooms and I'm at a a step study group. So that's the thing in six months, they go through 12 steps. Um, and not everybody goes through every step at that pace, but that it's the idea is to kind of get exposure to them. Yeah. And there's a bunch of people going through, you know, for the third time, for the fourth time. Um, and, and, it, and they seem to pick up something new every time. So um, that's been kind of a big learning is that this is, this is kind of a lifetime discipline. True. Then real so, quick on that note, um, yeah. I came to a realization, you know, now that I'm nearing the steps, I'm like, so am I done? Like, you know, it's not like one and then two and then three. It's, it's this evolving, you know, it's, I'm a task oriented person professionally and personally, you know, I have something I do it and then I'm done and I move on. But with, the steps that I'm learning is well, once I get to step 12, that doesn't mean the next morning I got to go right back to step one. Um, and if I have a mentality where I'm done with the steps, I'll probably relapse and slip like the next day. I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> See, right. That, someone's going to raise their hand and done that. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's been a great realization for me of the steps are like a living, breathing thing instead of, you know, a, a checklist, um, because you'll never really finish, you know, you may finish going through them, but the steps will never leave you. And, and that's just a really cool realization I've had. And it's really taken my recovery to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, step 10, it's, it's basically like steps one through nine on a daily basis. So, you know, that's a way to incorporate, you know, a lot of step work, you know, and, you know, concurrently doing, you know, 11 and 12 prayer and meditation and reaching out to others. So you're kind of incorporating all the steps on a daily basis, but yeah, getting through step 12 and uh, going through the steps again, uh, I've talked about it um uh, before in my share um, that my second trip through the steps uh, was looking at my acting in behaviors where I was looking at my acting out behaviors before my acting in my sexual anorexia and um, stuff like that. So the second trip through the steps were, you know, able to reveal more. And now I'm going uh, a full pass through, through the steps again, you know, I've done one, two, and three, um, formally, uh, I think three or four times now, but, um, not all, I haven't gone all the way through the steps, um, a third time. So that's what I'm doing right now. So before closing out, I wanted to, um, throw out a question to, to everyone. Um, any messages that, uh, that, um, they'd like to leave, with um what what advice you have for the the newcomer that uh is just coming into meetings or potentially thinking about coming into meetings i know that you know that that's already been discussed once or twice in, in this conversation already but if anyone has any thoughts on that well i was i was so terrified you know before coming to my first meeting and ashamed and no idea what people would think, um, you know, feeling very badly about myself. And it, the experience of coming into a place where people really understand what that feels like is extraordinary. Um, it really does feel like grace. Um, and um, it was a powerful experience. And so I would just encourage people to, to try it. You've got literally nothing to lose. Um, I would say, um, 
don't let a negative stigma prevent you from finding happiness. Um, as someone from another 12 step awesome. program, I never thought that my other 12 step program would be like, like society accepts me and they're like, Oh, you're, are you okay? Like, Oh, that's so great that you're doing this. Then if you say like you're a sex addict, they're like, hide your kids, hide your wife. Like, like nobody wants to speak with you. Um, and for me, you know, I, you know, my parents were like, oh, you're not this. Don't, you know, you're being too hard on yourself. You're not a sex addict. And I said, well, I think there's something wrong with me. And if the societal stereotype is the only thing that's holding me back and screw it. And, uh, it's, it's been worth it ever since. So that's great. Um, yeah, no, I, I think what I would, yeah, obviously the, the motto is keep coming back. Um, but you got to get into, got to get into a room first before you can come back. So just get into a room. Um, and I think what I want newcomers to message they can hear is that, uh, if it's just one of hope, if you think you can't stop, the truth is you can, um, anyone can, there's a line in the, in our literature that says rarely have we ever seen a person who has thoroughly followed our paths fail that I, I said that wrong, but, um, uh, it's closer to nobody who, no one who has ever followed this path has failed. Cause if you fail, there's room for you to do it again. And you can, uh, I just, yeah. these steps just, and this program is just designed. It's crazy that this program, I, I can go way into it, but like how AA was, this is based off of AA, which was developed in the thirties off of like gut instinct and like faith that this program would work. And like, and through the years, like science has validated like all of this stuff, like 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 how much community is. In, I mean, what a huge role community plays in in addiction and 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 all this stuff that we've learned about the brain. Like AA is just almost like yeah, we yeah, we already knew that. That's what it gets, that's what it feels like when you when you when you read really dig into addiction. But I would say if you think you can't stop, you can. Um, I was at a point at fever pitch of my addiction, where I couldn't stop acting out for more than a couple hours. Um, I was on these apps with women, um, I'll spare you the details, but um, I would constantly freak out, delete the apps, delete my profile and like swear it off. And then I'd only to get back on. When I would get back on some of these apps, you'd, I'd get like a text or an email saying, here's your registration code to get up, to, to, to get back on. And uh, when I was writing, when I was going through the, when I, I'm sorry, when I first came into the, came in and I was trying to figure out my disclosure and do my first step, I went back and looked at my texts and looked at my emails. There were days where I was deleting the apps in my profiles like four, five times a day. I was just deleting the app, swearing it off, wow. and I would last like two hours only to just jump back in again. So I literally couldn't go more than two hours without betraying my partner and diving into this bullshit. Um, and today, I like in two days, I will, I will have not done any of that crap for 10 months. Nice. And it's, um, yeah. The second thing I would say is that what made me feel good I, after I realized it and someone shared it with me was, you coming into the room is helping other people. And that feels really freaking good. You being a newcomer, sharing, even just sharing your desperation and your fear, like guys that are 10, 15, 20 years sober, I mean, you're helping them remember why they're in the room. Um, I've had guys uh, I've connected with who I literally are me 15, 20 years ago. And if I can help this kid stop this behavior and spare him those 20 years I wish I could get back, then he's doing me, he's being of service to me, you know, just, just letting me share my experience with him and hearing his. So the minute you come into the room, you're part of a community. And um, it's just, I don't know how to wrap this up, but yeah, just, um, I'll just repeat it. Yeah. The minute you come into a room, you're being of service to other people. And that just feels good. 
Yeah, yeah. I had mentioned that today at the the noon meeting. We had a, a reading on um, doing service, and uh, a lot of my experience was doing service work at meeting level, and then at intergroup level and ISO level, and then eventually get uh, sharing stories with other addicts, um, you know, via the podcast. And, you know, there were a couple of people that were, you know, just brand new, you know, they've been uh, in the meetings for, you know, um, you know, maybe less than a month and, you know, what, what service can I do? You know, I'm, I'm just, just starting. And um, I um, had mentioned in, in the chat, you know, just by sharing your story here at a meeting, you are being of service. And, you know, that's, you know, one of the things that us, you know, tonight sharing our, our stories, you know, helps other, other addicts. So it's being of service. So, you know, it's an incredible, incredible gift. Um, anyway, I wanted to say that, you know, I'm truly grateful for everyone showing up here tonight and sharing their stories. And we'll be doing uh, some more of these uh, coming up. So nice, man. Thanks again, Great. dude. This is awesome. Thanks, Thanks for doing this. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Okay. Talk to you guys. See you guys. Bye. I really love this conversation. I hope you did too. And I was just amazed with the amount of insight that each of these guys have have had in their first year of recovery getting to learn about where they are in the steps and the insights that they've gained uh, their messages to the newcomers and of course you know just hearing how the covid lockdown affected them in their addiction and finding their way to the rooms of saa in the conversation we uh shared a lot of different links about different ways to find meetings. A lot of people found information on Google. You can always go to the saa-recovery.org and hit the find a meeting button there at the top of the page. And you can navigate to um, localized meetings or telemeetings. There's also uh, saatalk.info which is an exclusive website for phone meetings and Zoom meetings, electronic meetings. And of course, the bayareasaa.org website. And I will be leaving the links for all of those in the show description. And as the middle of March approaches here in 2021, our Bay Area annual retreat is coming up, and this year we are doing it on Zoom. And I am part of the retreat committee working on the talent show. Uh, I have a huge passion for music and artistry and outer circle activities and just love the talent show aspect of the retreat as well as all the workshops and speaker meetings. So in the next week or two, I'm not sure exactly what I'll be getting to record for the podcast. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, that I may do some short one-off podcasts that are of shorter lengths, um, that I won't need to do outside recordings. With that, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I thank you again for listening. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA.